Well, good luck. I'm going to go invisible. We will begin shortly. We're going to let the numbers stabilize as people are coming into the Zoom room. So it looks like our numbers are stabilizing. So welcome to the Every Learner Everywhere Strategies for Success in Online Teaching and Learning, the reprise of our interactive conference series. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. My name is Norma Hollebeck and I'm the manager for network programs and services with Every Learner Everywhere. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to take just a, a couple of minutes out to tell you about Every Learner Everywhere and the mission of our network. Every Learner Everywhere is a collaboration of 12 higher education organizations with expertise in evaluating, implementing, scaling, and measuring the efficacy of digital learning and its integration into pedagogical practice. Every Learner Everywhere is one of three solution networks sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Here at Every Learner, we work with colleges and universities to build capacity among faculty and instructional support staff to improve student outcomes with digital learning. Our mission is to help institutions use new technology to innovate teaching and learning with the ultimate goal of increasing student success, especially for first generation college students, poverty impacted students and students of color. Some quick housekeeping notes. We are recording today's presentation, which we will share with you after the webinar. Throughout the presentation, we welcome your questions in the Q&A sections. If you're raising your hand, we're not gonna be able to unmute you for the duration of the presentation, but we will be monitoring the Q&A section as well as the chat. As a biology professor and a recovering associate dean, I'm excited about today's discussion Engage using adaptive courseware and digital technology to enhance student learning. Our speakers today are Drs. Carrie McFarland and Dr. Harmony Tucker. Dr. McFarland enjoys teaching general chemistry at Colorado State University, where she is an ass assistant teaching professor. She earned a BA in chemistry from Williams College and a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Go Badgers! <laughs> she has 20 years of teaching experience and utilizes active learning, adaptive, and digital resources as valuable pedagogical tools. Dr. Tucker has been teaching chemistry at Colorado State University since 2004. As a senior instructor in the general chemistry program, she has taught over 10,000 students in both terms of this long sequence. Um, she is enthusiastic about bringing demonstrations and active learning to her classes and she sees adaptive and digital resources as key elements to helping students master this complicated material. I will now hand it over to Dr. McFarland and Dr. Tucker. Thank you very much, Norma, for that kind introduction and welcome to all of our uh, national and international guests today. Uh, we certainly understand, uh, I see in the chat that some people are hoping to get home because it's knowing where they are and 
as uh, people who had a delayed start to school today and a cancellation of things in the afternoon yesterday, we understand how that goes. So uh, today, uh, again, I'm uh, Harmony Tucker and, um, and a senior instructor in the chemistry program at CSU. Carrie, do you okay. want to say anything additional? I'm Carrie McFarland, also at CSU. We are looking forward to, to sharing with you some things that we have learned with about using adaptive courseware and digital technology in both in-person and online classes, especially in particular for our case, very large classes, which really help those help us use those, uh, really help by those tools. And so we'd like to move on to the next slide, please, um, which is our first poll question. So um, we're going to be activating this polling question just so that we have an idea of uh, who, who's joining us today, uh, what some of your motives are. So go ahead and if you could put in your vote, we'll um, try to collect that information and then share that with everyone in about a minute. So we recognize that even though we are instructors, uh, it is not necessarily the case that that is going to be our dominant audience. And uh, we'd just like to know who all is here today. And if you are someone who is selecting other and you would like to share what your role is at your institution, that is something you could go ahead and add to the chat if you feel that would be uh, good information to have. And I'm not sure if uh, if Norma can uh, let us uh, if 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 we've had a lot of the participants have a chance to participate. Uh, maybe give us a few more seconds to finish finish up this question. And I'm pushing to go over 85 percent participation. <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful goal. Once we get there, um, feel free to share the poll results with us. All right, so slightly more than half of us are instructors and they're also instructional designers, some administrators, IT and other, excellent. And so I see there are some instructional analysts and academic operations um, coming in in the chat there. So thank you very much for, for sharing um, that aspect. Um, and I'd say next slide, please. So today we're going to be talking about uh, adaptive courseware and uh, digital resources that we are using. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about some of our overall goals. In the general chemistry program at CSU, we have defined sets of learning outcomes that we want our students to have at their fingertips by the end of the term. What do we want them to know? What they sh should they be able to do by the end of the term? And we do have these broken up into units of sort of exam sized units of, of these learning outcomes. And so one of the things that we have found and that is certainly backed up by research is that use of um, active engagement, whether this is uh, talking to a neighbor in a physical classroom or engaging in some adaptive courseware is a useful way of presenting information and allowing students to manipulate it in such a way that they are able to reach those learning outcomes. So one of the things that we really encourage is this learning by doing and trying to make sure that people are given adequate practice of these ideas in such a way that they are able to be successful in eventual summative assessments that we give in our classes. So for those who may not be familiar with the term adaptive courseware, we just want to note that this is uh, courseware that collects data 
through some sort of an assessment and looks at that data and uses that information to provide a more personalized learning path for students. It also can collect data that instructors can look at on some kind of a dashboard, for instance, to help guide the general learning experience of the class based on the result of a particular assessment. If we could go on to the next slide, please. This is another poll question that Norma is going to be putting up. And this is just to give us an idea um, of what your uh, ex expertise is with adaptive courseware. So again, we'll spend about a minute collecting this information. And yes, we will be going into um, a more specific discussion of adaptive courseware and what specifically we are using. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that we have a, uh, an idea of, of our audience for today. And I definitely support Norma in trying to do another 85% participation uh, before we release the results of this poll, if possible. We are almost there. I just need to get at least 3% more of you all to participate. There we go. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so we have a fair number of folks here today who um, are really brand new to the idea of adaptive courseware. And I'm hoping that um, as Carrie leave, leads us through the next few slides, that this will help you to know that what. And um, it also looks like a lot of people have not used adaptive courseware, but are thinking about it um, perhaps as the result of some of our experiences over these last couple of years. Um, there are other people who would like to learn a little bit more and um, it looks like, so we've got a whole lot of uh, folks who are potential uh, adapters. So we appreciate that. If we could move on to the next slide, please. And Carrie is going to uh, take, take that one. Hi, so we'd like, excuse me, <clears throat> to, um, talk about both adaptive digital systems and non-adaptive digital systems. And we have found in our classes that both of these are very useful. Um, we originally started with a, with a, was a, a group at CSU who was looking at adaptive courseware in particular, and they have a very useful features. Um, the adaptive courseware tends to include um, uh, a nice way for students to to serve students where they start. So wherever they're at is a good place for them to start. So it provides personalized instructions for the students um, by giving them a, usually a pretest at the beginning, um, depending on the system, um, and helping them the faster they learn the topics, the faster they finish their homework assignments. Um, one nice thing for many of these systems is that the pretest feature of things like Alex can allow students to skip topics that they already know. So they don't have to work through them. Uh, whereas students who are struggling with those will be having to take a little more time to work through those topics. And so they tend to have a model where if students miss a question, they're either asked, uh, they're given an explanation, a little bit of background, and then either immediately or later in a cycle, we'll have more practice on the same topic. And they can usually see their progress increasing until they have mastered the content of a particular chapter or a particular topic or in some cases, even filling up with a progress in a pie chart over the course of a semester. 
Um, there are usually a variety of different questions that students can work through. Uh, these seem to be increasing more and more every year, the, the variety of questions that are available. And they um, often, often, often offer students opportunities for extra practice outside of class, in addition to a certain amount of required practice to meet certain uh, thresholds that have been set up for progress through the course. Some of these systems um, emphasize mastery in such a way that students are retested on material from time to time. So for example, in the Alex system, um, you can set it up so that every week or every few weeks or whatever interval you like, students are going to take another knowledge check to make sure that not only did they learn the topic back when they first worked through it a couple of weeks ago, but that they still actually know it. That's particularly important for classes such as chemistry, where we are continuing to build on previous concepts over the whole course of the semester. And so that's a really valuable feature of some of the adaptive systems. Um, one thing that we have noticed when we were relying more heavily on the adaptive systems is that there are a few things that those systems don't do well yet. And one of the things they don't do well yet is add challenging questions with a lot of variety. So if you choose an adaptive topic, say in Alex, that's a, that's a difficult one that requires many different parts, students are asked to do it not just once, but three or four or five times. And that becomes rather burdensome and again takes away the idea of it being an opportunity for students to have a lot of variety in practice. So some systems are um, more useful with static assignments. Um, we can ask more complicated questions. You can uh, raise the bar on the level of difficulty there. These are often useful for helping students experience new types of questions such as those they might see on an exam. And so there are definitely advantages for, for these types of systems. Ideally, we'd like to see the, the two systems working together with each other better so that students can do core concepts with adaptive practice and use non-adaptive static assignments um, as problem sets to help students elevate their learning. Uh, there are some issues with academic integrity issues with the homework helper sites, especially when um, these are a significant part of students' grades. So we do, have to, we do have to watch out for those things. Next slide, please. Um, and different, we can also think about the different points in the Bloom's content pathway that adaptive and non-adaptive courseware can be particularly useful to students. Adaptive courseware is very helpful for covering lower level Bloom's content outside of class. Uh, for example, McGraw-Hill's Smart Book is an adaptive uh, reading assignments that helps students master basic um, vocabulary and some core concepts before class. And so we like to use that um, in assignments before lecture um, homework for students. The non-adaptive types of assignments are actually pretty useful for higher level Bloom's topics such as applying, um, applying students' learning. And so we find those very useful there. Okay, next slide, please. So just to fill you in on um, what um, has motivated Carrie and myself to explore some of the adaptive courseware and digital technology that we're using, we wanted to let you know about our teaching scene in general chemistry at CSU because, you know, large means different things to different people. So each section that we teach of general chemistry typically contains about 250 to 300 students. And there are between three and five sections of each uh, chemistry course that are offered. So one of the things that we are doing is dealing with a very large number of people and trying to effectively um, monitor their progress and try to pick tools that will reach the largest number of people. It's also nice to have platforms that are at least somewhat uniform across the section. So when we're teaching multiple sections of a course, we do things like share a syllabus, we share the courseware that we're going to be using, and we follow up with the students as a group even if they are in different sections of the course. 
when Carrie and I uh, were starting teaching before we were at CSU, we have both taught at places where, you know, large meant 50 people or something like that. And so we've had uh, different experiences with, with smaller numbers of, of people where you were more likely perhaps to know everyone's name. Um, but we still want to have instant feedback with these large numbers of students to make sure that we are reaching them to such an extent that, you know, okay, we want to just touch base with them sometimes in the middle of lecture. And so we will do things like use eye clickers to get a multiple choice question, um, sort of information fed back to us in real time in the lecture to let us know if we should review this concept some more or if we're ready to go on. We recognize that active learning helps to motivate and engage students. And certainly talking to students in class can be very helpful. They, as Carrie mentioned, really appreciate not having to have um, review of things that they have already mastered. And so the adaptive courseware allows them to focus on the things that are on their learning edge. And even when we are using face-to-face uh, -face learning, our, our classes this semester are face-to-face, -face. Um, we have had a massive disruption, as I suspect many of you have over the last couple of years, where there have been expectations that we will be um, all of a sudden online and um, where we have, we have, so we have run classes as Zoom sessions. We have produced videos to help present content and um, having the option of uh, these adaptive courseware so that they can really practice some of these core ideas as much as they need to on their own is a really useful component of that. One of the things that is nice about uh, having a lot of things available online and being able to follow up with students, for instance, who are falling behind for something, is that we are um, able to be a bit more flexible when we have students who are not able to join us in person for certain abrupt reasons. So we have, for instance, a fair number of students who are unable to attend classes because they are in quarantine or they are ill. And um, we, are, we have heightened expectations that we're gonna be flexible with that. And so the use of digital technology has really helped us to supply um, that contact with students who are not there in face-to-face. -face. And finally, we are able to provide some supplemental materials in a digital format so that, for instance, students who need just a little bit of extra um, hand-holding to get through certain ideas, that we have that information available so that they can uh, pursue that on their own. So supplemental videos and the um, providing extra practice uh, for students outside the classroom, for those who just need a little bit of extra review of these ideas. That is something that's important important and possible uh, by using these technologies. Uh, and the next slide, please. We found that the adaptive and digital other digital technologies are actually useful at multiple stages of the process for students. So there are different um, products that work better for helping students prepare for class and then in class and then after class learning as well as student outreach. And so uh, when deciding which types of platforms to use, it's, it's important to think about what the role of that technology will be. So for example, we use some Alex prep to help students prepare for chemistry before they first take any, before they even register for the course, we've set up a, an Alex prerequisite that um, gets students up to speed on their essential math skills. Um, and for those students who don't need any review, they can test out of it and move on quickly. For students who need a little refresher on some of those basic math skills, they have time uh, on their own time to work through all the skills that they need to, to get started in chemistry. Oh. Similarly, we use those smart book adaptive reading assignments before class um, to help have students show up for class prepared. 
it saves a lot of time um, in, in walking through students through the vocabulary to be able to dive right into problem solving and it allows more time for in-class learning activities such as practice problem solving. And so that's a very helpful role for preparing for class. And as Harmony mentioned, the supplemental videos um, and often sometimes Canvas quizzes can be used to help bring everyone up to speed before class. And in class, there are a number of different technologies that work now in, in person or online. And as Harmony mentioned for uh, hybrid groups. So although iClicker used to be a device that students had to bring to class, there is now a version of iClicker that works on students' phones and can work remotely. And um, same thing with, there's a, a useful chem, chemistry learning tool called the Chem 101 app that works on students' phones or laptops. And that is a great way for students to engage in problem solving practice um, in class. And we've used these both in person and online. We give the students the problems, let them work on them. Um, when they're in person, um, they can even work with each other. We can have learning assistants circulating throughout the room. They can solve these problems. And we get the instant feedback as to how long it's taking them to solve the problems and how well they're understanding the topics. And for students, they're also getting that feedback of how well they understand it. Especially in a class such as chemistry, students often think they're understanding it because they're watching someone solve problems who already knows how to do it. And then they discover when they go to learn on their own that they're to practice on their own that they don't have as deep an understanding as possible. So having some format for interactive active learning in class is, is really helpful. Uh, Zoom polls are a way that we brought this type of learning um, into the classroom when we were fully online last semester. Um, the simplest way that I found to set that up was just to have polls that asked A, B, C, D, E and popped up on my slides, different questions, and I could watch students making progress through them um, in real time. And they found that helpful for practicing. And then after class, there are levels of practice such as students mastering core skills or applying those core skills to more advanced problem solving. We've used a few different um, systems for that. And then uh, student outreach, which is especially important digitally uh, for large classes such as ours can be facilitated by some of the tools in some of the digital systems dashboards as well as canvas which now has some new analytics that helps us identify students who are missing an assignment or didn't score well on an assignment and can help automate um, assembling email lists to message those students who need a little extra um, a little extra support uh, next slide please um, and before I talk about the CSU, I just wanted to emphasize that one of the things that we had run into as an issue with some of our classes was um, having an uneven preparation for our class, particularly in terms of the math background, because we state, you know, we use any of these math classes, but for students who have had perhaps a few years of a gap between uh, when they last took that math and when they are taking our course, or even if they've taken the what we what we expect them to have mastered in a particular math equivalent course, uh, we were not necessarily seeing that um, as for the students coming into the class. So having a, an adaptive uh, courseware system, we use Alex to make sure that students really have learned that or to have them have a chance to relearn it on their own so that we know exactly what math skills we can expect them to have that has really produced a better starting field for our students coming in and it makes the first exam of the semester in particular a lot smoother. So these adaptive courseware systems um, that are used at CSU are not just used in chemistry. They have been used in a number of different uh, courses and an increasing number of courses. I do not unfortunately uh, have additional uh, data beyond that, but this is something that we have been uh, using in a number of different classes of different sizes and in very different fields. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide, please. We have had feedback from a lot of different uh, fields at CSU who do use adaptive courseware. And 
even though the systems themselves may be different um, in different fields, we are able generally to observe a lot of um, accountability for students. We can make sure that they're keeping up with certain ideas by watching their progress through this courseware. And it does provide a helpful practice for them. It really, as um, on the top right-hand comment, the, the term allowing students to work on their learning edge, this is something that personally I have found very key. It is important for students to not have to do a lot of practice problems on material that they do already understand. And it's also important for them to not be asked questions that are way beyond where they are if they do not have the fundamental material mastered. And adaptive learning, because it essentially assigns uh, students the topics that they are ready to learn, really allows them to work on that learning edge, which is something that is really important in our, our field in, in chemistry. I think that having that intentionality is something that people have found uh, very, very useful. And um, of course, it does note that this is a valuable tool, but not a magic bullet. If we could have the next slide, please. If we could go ahead and have the next slide, please. A little bit of a glitch, we're getting there. <laughs> no worries. Um, so one of the things that uh, is also helpful is that in, in class, sometimes as uh, there was a comment there and I, we don't need to move slides around, but there is a little comment that sometimes we just don't have enough time in our lecture periods in order to give students all the practice that they need. They really need to work on it outside of class, but we, um, we can assign this adaptive courseware and that can help give them that practice. Now, one of the things that sometimes happen is that they sometimes try to sort of game the system and try to use this technology in a way that is not as helpful for them as it really could be. For some fields at CSU, people have found that they are not uh, able to really get the kind of practice that they'd like the students to get through the adaptive courseware available in their field. So it can be that the questions are perhaps a little too hard or they're too fundamental, and that is not providing the students that learning edge practice that we have found very helpful in the systems that, that we are, are using. Also for some students, it can provide a financial burden. Um, if you are, are working with a publisher at your institution, sometimes you can get a deal on bundles of, you know, say software with a particular text. And that is something that is, has been useful for us. Um, so even though, and, and there are sometimes some technical limits associated with your system. You may have the ability to control certain aspects of it, but not other aspects. And sometimes you learn that in real time. And um, so it can be challenging uh, as an instructor to deal with the limitations of, of that particular system. So for instance, you may find that if you have published a particular assignment, then you are no longer able to modify it in any way or in the way that you had hoped to be able to modify it. So sometimes um, you can, with a little foresight, make sure that you have eliminated things that might come up as a, as a problem for, for students. Um, and let's go on to the next slide, please. A few things that we have learned in our experience with a number of different 
types of uh, digital courseware. Um, we thought we'd discuss those here. Uh, the first thing I wanted to know is that small steps add up. And sometimes we feel like we have to dive in and completely reinvent our classes, maybe flip the whole class or just not bother. And it's much, uh, we would encourage people to just try one small thing at a time, try one new system, pick some, some, um, some part of the class that you think, your class that you think could be enhanced with um, some digital courseware and, and try one thing. Um, and as Harmony noted, there is, there is varied flexibility for the different systems and it's important to keep an eye on that. We've also noticed that some of the systems are becoming a little more flexible as time goes on. We continue to let them know what we think uh, some of the issues are with their systems and sometimes they're responding. So for example, in the smart book pre-lecture readings, it used to be that we would have to assign the whole chapter or well, a sub chapter, you'd have to assign a whole subsection or not. And you had no control over which concepts in that chapter students had to master. Um, but the newer system now allows us to look at the more granular level. We can pick which concepts we want to include, which concepts we want to skip, um, which saves our students a lot of time and effort on concepts that we are not emphasizing. Um, as Harmony noted, we've also noticed that sometimes once you open an assignment, you very often can't change anything about it except to move the due date back, for example, and sometimes you can remove problems, but sometimes you can't remove things and sometimes you can't change them much. So we have found that a, a, a good practice is to set up the due dates for all the assignments in the semester, uh, but only open them a week or two at a time, especially at the beginning of the semester, while you're figuring out what the implications are of various settings that you choose. Um, some systems allow students to submit assignments late for a penalty, some don't. So we all have, they all have their own little, their own little glitches. And they do serve different roles in the class. Uh, we also wanted to note that it's easy to pile on too many questions or use too many systems because we see all these great things. Oh, this would be a great way to learn this topic. Or this is a good practice for that. And uh, it's important to keep an eye on how it all adds up and the fact that some students will need to take a lot more time to answer these problems, questions than, than others. And so we try to be aware of the, uh, the time that it will take students all together. We've also found that it's very helpful to have student buy-in. And so using some very intentional messaging to explain very clearly to students what's the purposes of the, uh, the homework system is important. Uh, a lot of students view homework as a chore that needs to be done, such as vacuuming, and they don't recognize that the value in it is the learning they get from it, not just completing it and having it done. So that's something that we're um, trying to be very conscious of and communicating very clearly to students the purpose of these things. Next slide, please. And I just to compliment what Carrie was saying, I think that one of the things that our topic today does not address, but that is an important issue is the issue of points that are attributed to different types of uh, assignments that are given in the class. It is such a tricky balance, and I can't say that I'm there yet, uh, trying to make sure that you are assigning enough points that students actually will use the tool without feeling overburdened by it or feeling uh, compelled to seek out those infamous homework helper sites in order to complete assignments. Because of course, we are assigning the points because we really want them to do the assignment. And in some cases, they are not interpreting the assignment in the same way that, that we are interpreting it. So some of the platforms that we have used, and we are not using all of these all the time, uh, but we are using uh, or and have used Alex as a, a system that has been very useful for, for many years uh, for giving students that, first of all, the prep work to make sure that before they even join the class that we know exactly what they've been able to show mastery of in terms of their background. We also use that for mastery of these fundamental uh, practice questions uh, that they run into. 
the learn smart and smart book systems that are provided by uh, McGraw Hill are what we tend to think of as more of an active reading to help prepare the students for a lecture on a particular topic so that they are coming in having completed some work on this topic. We find that when we make these assignments due before class time, it means that they are, even if it's just for a couple of points, it is something that they are more likely to have at least accomplished that reading and thought about it a little bit before they come in to the lecture. And that means that they are more able to engage in, say, discussion questions with their classmates, which is something that Carrie and I really encourage, and that they are also more successful at answering questions that we ask during class that require either the Chem 101 app or iClicker responses in class so we can sort of see how are they, um, how are they learning this, this information. And the new analytics that are in Canvas allow us to follow up on a particular assignment for particular students. So we can, for instance, send them a note and say, we noticed that you did not do this particular assignment. I am, you know, just, we have, you know, maybe we would make a note that they can receive extra help on this topics, or we may note that there is an extension on that topic. That sort of analysis is allowing us to follow up with students who we think are disengaging from our class and to really follow up with them. I'm also going to note that in Alex, there is a dashboard that allows you to do things like look at a particular topic and you could say, oh, 60% of the class has actually completed such and such a topic but it's a really important topic for them to have mastered before they are taking an exam on that topic. And so again, you could message all the students who had not yet completed that topic, reiterate its importance, maybe provide some information about how to get some extra help on it. And that kind of personalized feedback is um, very, very useful. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and have us move to the next slide. Can I ask you a real quick question that seems pertinent right now? Yes, please. There's a question in the chat that fits really well with what you're talking about. And David's asking, is there an example that you can give of a question or, or set which you might use to decide if a student should work through a pre-topic or is ready or to post-test and decide if more work is necessary on that topic. So what kind of goes into that decision-making process? All right, so for instance, um, if we are looking at uh, chemical equilibrium uh, kinds of, of problems, and we are going to be talking about applying equilibrium discussions to weak acids, if a student is unable to perform a sort of a generic calculation involving chemical equilibrium, they are not then going to be ready to participate in a, a discussion of how this applies to a weak acid system. Does that address that issue? If they, if they are not um, successful at answering certain questions, that are fundamental to the next set of material. We really want them to be able to go back and practice the more fundamental uh, concepts first. And systems like Alex will not only allow you to work through until you have mastered something, but as Carrie mentioned before, they will occasionally offer an assessment where you go back and you prove that you have retained such and such a topic. And if you are not able to answer the question correctly, even if you had shown mastery before, 
then it will again open that up for you and give you uh, practice on that topic some more. Um, there are a different number of questions um, that are given to students in systems like Alex. It is all dependent on how well they have done on an initial assessment of their skills. So for instance, a student who is answering a bunch of questions correctly, Alex is going to say to itself, oh, the student understands this. I wonder if they're gonna understand this. If they answer that question correctly, it's going to keep asking sort of higher level things. Students who are getting questions wrong are going to be given more and more fundamental questions and then sort of build up their skills from there. So they will actually be asked more questions overall. So it's not necessarily that we don't actually manually pick how many questions they're going to have. We pick the topics and students who are successful at showing mastery of those topics will have a varying number of questions depending on whether they're able to show that they have that mastery or not. Does that get to it? It's not, and again, we don't, it's, it's um, there's a difference between the number of topics and the number of questions that they are asked it, because really what we want them to do is have those the, the topics mastered. And so it can be a diff very different number of questions for different students, especially if they are, clicking I don't know a lot. If they, if they don't understand certain things, then Alex will help to teach them, which is great if they really need to do that. But again, one of the problems that we've run into is if students are not really taking the system seriously and they click I don't know for things they actually do know, then they're kind of creating some extra work for themselves and they will be asked more questions. For chemistry, it's helpful. It's useful that Alex often Alex has hardly any multiple choice questions for chemistry. So there, there is endless variety, and the questions change, format some, and so we don't have to worry about that. And in the um, smart book pre-reading assignments or pre the lecture reading assignments that we've been using, they uh, they use some multiple choice, but they do mix them up and they they move from topic to topic over the through the process. So students aren't just asked the same question over and over again. So if a student misses something, it, the, the, the system may then move them on to a different concept and then cycle back. And I think it's set up so that they have to answer two questions correctly about each concept, but they're never back to back. So um, it would be slower to write down the details. You know, and if they do take notes on what the different definitions mean, that's actually the same thing we'd like them to get out of the system anyway. And so I imagine it varies from course to course, but it's it's very helpful to rely on the software that these products already have in them instead of us trying to ask these questions and set them up ourselves. And I was looking to talk about the considerations for choosing a system, but I think we've actually already addressed most of these. There are different roles for different systems. Some of them have better questions than others. Some of the systems are more fun for students than others. Chem 101 app is actually kind of a fun way for students to practice chemistry. Um, other systems are a little more tedious and burdensome. Um, ease of use for instructors and flexibility for settings. Those are all some important considerations um, when you're choosing a system, as well as pricing, which should have been on here as well, I suppose, and points. So I don't know if we have time now for a discussion or if we should go on to Q. Should we go ahead? So I think why don't we go ahead and we're going to have a, um, a Padlet discussion where you can, um, there is going to be a uh, link in the chat. And when you um, enter the Padlet, there is a pink dot. You can click on that and post a, a comment. You can do so by name if you wish, or you can do so anonymously. And if you click publish, then we should be able to see your posting on this Padlet. If you are looking at someone's comment and you think, oh, that's a really good one, then you could you know, give it a rating um, to help draw attention to 
uh, that comment and we can try to uh, discuss ideas as, as they come up as a good topic to discuss. Um, we've had we've had the opportunity to use um, these products uh, in advance. And we have, I, I, I think that one of the things that, that we find is that we're really big and we break things. So we've had the experience of you know, we can, we can play with tools as instructors, but we aren't the same as a thousand undergraduates who maybe don't have the same sort of expectations um, or interpretations of questions that the students have. And so even though we have, um, you know, basically we have ended up uh, trying multiple products. And I like to think that we have personally made Alex a better system um, just by our many opportunities to try to break the system through the, you know, our, the, the thousand students who we have who are, are uh, working their way through it. Um, I don't know if there are things being posted on the Padlet. I, oh, here, there we go. They're coming in slowly. Right. Um, maybe while you're waiting, we could answer. There's a couple of questions that I can toss your direction while folks are working in Padlet. Please. One of them is, do you by chance have the knowledge, background information, whatever, that can explain the reason that economics and French courses transitioned off of using courseware based on that one slide that you were showing who all was using courseware at CSU? Uh, although I'm not sure of the specifics, I think that that had to do with the frowny face slide where it just wasn't at an appropriate level for what the teachers had expected to be able to do. So again, we consider the adaptive courseware um, to be really improving in our field. Um, and I note that some of those classes were things that were taught, you know, several years ago. And as we all know, with the mass uh, transition towards more online instruction and pouring more resources into that, it has really um, improved the system. So I don't know if there will, in fact, be an interest in going back to it at some point. However, I know that for different fields, just having very different um, uh, expectations for what the level is for your specific class, that's really a deciding factor for whether you want to actually use that technology or not. Um, we've, we've had some really good experiences with the technologies that we're using right now. And um, I can't say that everyone uh, loves all of our systems, that is not the case, but I definitely, I get positive feedback for, for all of them from a certain uh, amount of the class who really appreciate the kinds of practice that they get. And so there are, it looks like there are a lot of Connect people. Um, we use Connect a lot for our more static uh, homework sets that give them some of that higher level practice and help to get them ready for exams. We do tend to use the adaptive courseware for a little bit more of the lower level practice to make sure that they've mastered those um, fundamentals. Um, there's an, someone addressed the uh, class reluctance to participation in class discussions. And we found that the, um, the in-class tools are a great way for students to participate even if they're reluctant to raise their hand in a class with a couple hundred other students, they're still, they're still participating and we, all, we can direct them to work with the student in a lecture hall, talk to the student next to you, works pretty well. And then we get feedback from their responses in Clicker or Chem 101 app or it's online, a Zoom poll is a great way to get them um, participating even if they're a little bit reluctant. And we also found the, the, the courseware seems to be most most common and most well-developed for the entry-level classes. 
I just want to put another little shout out for eye clicker kinds of questions because you know, in the good old days, you used to have to have an eye clicker device and be in the classroom. One of the things that we are doing at CSU this term is we are committed to fully face to face classes. However, we also have this recognition that we have a lot of people out for one reason or another and having our lectures be live streamed and the use of the iClicker app on phones allows students to participate. They can answer these questions along with their classmates while they're viewing a live stream of our lecture. And that allows a lot of flexibility that we're trying to provide um, at, at this strange time. And I that's something that I find very satisfying. Um, I, I really appreciate being able to get that kind of feedback, um, even from people who are not in the class itself, because sometimes I don't always get a sense um, of what all the conversations are that are going on in the classroom or where everyone's at at home. Let's see. Um, so it looks like, uh, yeah, some people, you certainly we're using Alex. And when we talk about using Alex for our classes, we can pull in uh, not only some fundamental math practice, but also chemistry. Um, Alex is nice in that you can have a particular text that uh, has been analyzed so that you can find topics that you want to pick out of a particular section of a particular text and get practice on specifically those ideas, even though it's not really exactly what we would call textbook specific. It doesn't have to be sort of hand in hand with this particular textbook because it's more fundamental questions. Can I toss a question to you all? Somebody's asking if, uh, I think David's asking, have you used Realize It or any other content agnostic platform? And if so, were there any unique lessons learned with those platforms compared to publisher platforms? I have not used that. Um, are you I can say if they do want information on that, University of Central Florida uses Realize It a lot in their modern languages. So y'all might wanna look towards them. Uh, David, if you're interested. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and I have not used uh, MindTap. Um, again, I and, and I am currently using Connect as a more static set of homework problems in, in my classes. And I do like being able to assign um, that, you know, chapter section specific practice with uh, you know a set of, it's not adaptive, but you know they they do ask multiple questions so that you have a little bit of variety within that system. So um, if you have and yeah, realize it. Yeah, that's just not something that I am familiar with. Carrie, do you want to say anything about that Chem One Hundred and One app before we? I know we're running out of time here. I think that's one of the nice things about having being able to write your own questions is, is useful. So that's one of the nice things about the iClicker. Um, Chem 101 app for, for chemistry provides a whole bank full of questions and a wide variety. They're not just multiple choice and students really do find it fun. I hope kind of like Duolingo um, has a little bit of a game aspect to it. And so those, those are really useful for helping students out. Um, and it's nice to have that kind of flexibility as well where you can um, in the iClicker or Chem 101 and write your own questions for participation in class. I think we want, I guess are we about ready to turn it back over? It's been great to talk to everybody today. Yeah, I appreciate everyone coming here. You know, one of the things that we really appreciate is, you know, trying to have this, it's just another, these are tools in your toolbox that can be used to enhance any different uh, part of the class from the experience getting ready for class, in class, following up with students. And like Carrie says, if you're interested in doing something like this, start small because 
having everything happening all at once is just a little overwhelming. And we've all had a lot of overwhelming these last few years. But I would encourage you, those of you, the many of you who are interested in sort of dipping a toe in the water, try, try something, add something, have it be worth a small number of points, um, but give it a try because we've, we've had a really positive experience with our systems overall. So thank you, Carrie and Harmony. This was a wonderful, very informative um, session. Uh, we really do appreciate uh, your time and your energy on this. Um, real quick for our audience, you can access all of the Strategies for Success webinar recordings at, on our Strategies for Success YouTube channel. We do ask that you take a little time out if you've got it and respond to our survey. We really enjoy getting your feedback. It helps us plan our future webinars and determine what we're doing right and what we need to work on. If you don't have time, if you got something right after, don't worry, we will send you the link to the survey when you get the follow-up email, as well as the link to the YouTube channel. Just a reminder, next week we have Flower Darby, our, our renowned author, that'll be talking to us uh, and presenting on the 27th. And then we've got some more Colorado State University folks on the 28th. Tanya and Jennifer, we're gonna be joining us and talking about the TILT framework that CSU has been working with. Um, and we've got future activities as well with uh, Every Learner Everywhere. Our partners at ATD have a, a wonderful social justice and equity webinar series coming up. And then Achieving the Dream has their Dream 22 conference coming up as well that we would really encourage y'all to consider. Quick reminder, we encourage you to visit the Every Learner Everywhere website, our resources page, including the workshop page. Again, thank you to uh, Carrie and Harmony. Thank you to our audience for participating in today's discussion. We look forward to seeing you next week uh, at our webinar, Online Teaching Strategies to Promote Equity and Inclusion by renowned author Flower Darby, as well as other and future Every Learner Everywhere events. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too.